The Medicine Hat District Germans from Russia Society is committed to recording first-person accounts of the history of Germans from Russia and Eastern Europe in Canada. Today, June the 17th, 2017, our interview is with Melvin Bender, a second-generation Canadian of Germans from Russia immigrants in Canada. Mr. Bender is one of the most knowledgeable students of the social history and genealogy of the German immigration into the Medicine Hat region. His broad experiences, research and travels are an important addition to the history and biography of our people. My name is Ted Grimm and I am pleased that Mel has agreed to grant this interview. Thanks Mel. I've mentioned to you that we're particularly interested in your broad ranging understanding of the history and I'd like to begin with some of that knowledge and uh, some of the experiences that you've had. Uh, so first of all, I'd like you to talk about what inspired you to get involved in the organizations related to Germans from Russia. I think I first became interested in Germans from Russia and my family history when my parents started writing a story, a family story, about their history for the Hilda Community History Book in the early 1970s. And from that I found out about a book called um, The Immigration from Germany to Russia by Carl Stump. And from that book I learned about a, a couple of Germans from Russia organizations that were busy in collecting Germans from Russia materials and that got me interested in our history. I mean like all other Germans from Russia we are always surprised to learn that we speak German but we come from Russia and, and that is was a puzzle that intrigued me at the time. That's interesting. So uh, what was your first contact with an organization, a formal organization? I think the first contact I made was with the Germans from Russia Heritage Society in Bismarck because they were more closely related to what I was researching. I was researching villages that were in the Black Sea area and that is what they concentrate on. The other organization, the American Historical Society of Germans from Russia, is more noted for their connection to the Volga German, Volga German colonies and therefore I was Although I joined both, both organizations, I was more interested in what the Bismarck organization had as far as resources and um, conferences that they had. So your uh, involvement then started really with the international organization uh, and then did you have any contact with any local organization or regional ones? Yes. At in 1984, I believe, there was a Medicine Hat and District chapter of the Germans from Russia Heritage Society and this chapter, I think, uh, went for about a dozen years before it folded. There was also, there was also a, a chapter of the other society, the American Historical Society of Germans from Russia in Calgary that I joined. So. I belonged to both chapters at, at one time or another and uh, I attended not every meeting certainly because I was working at the time. So your involvement of course that was the initial contact with the, the uh, basic organizations. What is your involvement now? Right now I, I'm a member of both of the Germ still a member of both of the Germans from Russia organizations in the States. I'm also a member of the Calgary chapter of the American Historical Society of Germans from Russia. I belong to the Metasatin District Genealogical Society and I am in charge of a Germans from Russia special interest group. So if there are members who need help with their ancestry, I try and help those members. 
uh, being, a, being the president of the Metasatin District um, Genealogical Society, I'm also a director of the Alberta uh, Genealogical Society. So you're kind of a go-to person if one wants to learn something. Do you, get, do you get phone calls and emails for information regarding the subject? Yes, I do. Um, sometimes I can help them and sometimes I cannot help them. Sometimes the records are not available and, and sometimes um, there are records but uh, they're not um, cannot be located or cannot aren't available at the time, and sometimes I, since my I, since I have contacts with people in the Germans from Russia Society, sometimes I can direct them to more knowledgeable people in the Germans from Russia societies that I belong to. You also uh, mentioned that you you've attended conferences and festivals and so on. Could you? So to give an idea where you've been to uh, continue your re personal research? Well, I've, I've been to quite a few of the Germans from Russia Heritage Society's conventions. They often have them in, in Bismarck, North Dakota. Sometimes they have them out of town. Since, since I'm a, the spokesperson for the Hoffnungstall Regional Interest Group, I have to attend the conventions now and we have one session which is composed of a meeting and a workshop. So that is going to be held again this year in July in Bismarck and I'll be attending that one. I've attended about five of the conventions of the other society. Uh, I think the one that was the most beneficial to me was the one that was in Lincoln, Nebraska which is the headquarters of that society and therefore they Therefore, when they have their convention there, you're able to go to the convention headquarters and look at the resources that are available. As a member of the uh, Metasatin District Germans from Russia Society, I was I helped with the uh, festivals that we had in 2003 and 2005. And then after the 2005, we started the Legacy Project, which was probably our most important achievement of all in that it resulted in a the Jim Hauser statue in front of uh, the Esplanade Arts and Heritage Center. With all of your uh, connections uh, and information that you've had access to, you probably have a pretty elaborate uh, personal library uh, and resource bank. Could you describe it somewhat? I do have quite a few resources, although as I get older I realize that some of these resources, instead of just remaining on my shelves, should be donated to libraries. So I do have quite a few resources on the villages that I'm interested in, where my answers came from. I also have books on the Black Sea Germans and the Bessarabian Germans and a few books on the Volga Germans. Along with that, I have some, quite a few maps on the settlements of the Germans from Russia, not only in, in the Ukraine and Russia, but also in settlements in the United States and South America and Canada. Your uh, involvement in the Genealogy Society has uh, been fairly long-standing. Uh, how does that fit into your research? your personal research now and what you're focused on? Other than being involved in the organization and doing the work, of course, but how does it fit? I think belonging to a genealogical society such as the Germans from Russia Society has helped me a great deal with my research. Uh, for example, um, through their newsletters, I was able to find out about three of my relatives who are now living in Germany and these relatives, uh, one of them uh, was doing some research through the society and sent a letter to the society and I found out about this letter and contacted the person. Another had a, a picture of their 
grandmother in the newsletter and I had a similar picture of the same person in my grandparents' photo albums. So I've, I've been able to contact these people and also visit these people um, after I took a journey to the homeland tour in, in Germany. Could you uh, uh, tell us some, something about the recent tour that you had to the Ukraine? And, and other areas that might might have been involved. Could you talk about the tour in general and the, we'll get to specifics later. The Journey to the Homeland Tour is, an, is a tour organized by the Germans, German Her Germans from Russia Heritage Collection in the North Dakota State uh, University Libraries. Uh, usually Michael Miller and and this Usually Michael Miller runs them, but this year he was accompanied by Jeremy Kopp, who's probably going to take over the tours in following years. This was from May 17th to 27th, so we spent three nights in Berlin, Germany, four nights in Odessa, and three nights in Stuttgart. So the three days in Berlin, we, we did take a day tour of Berlin and a day tour of Potsdam and then on the following day uh, we um, went flew to Odessa and we did take a tour of Odessa and then we had two days where we had where we were allowed to have visits to ancestral villages that we wanted to go to I wanted to go to three of my ancestral villages, Hofnumstall, Kassel, and Gross Liebenthal. And I visited those in one of them by myself in a, with a van and a driver and another with four other people in a van with a driver. So it, it was a, an excellent tour, although the first day it was kind of raining, but that kind of put a damper on the situation. After that we had a on the final day we had a tour of Odessa and then we had a traditional meal in an Alsace restaurant and we flew, uh, then we flew back to Stuttgart. So your uh, vill uh, villages, the ancestral villages that you visit, could you describe where they are in relation to Odessa because a lot of people who might be uh, reviewing this interview sometime will have some perspective on it. Could you give us an idea? The first village I visited was Gross Liebenthal, which is only about 20 kilometers west of Odessa. So it's a very short drive and the, the village is close to the Black Sea. It's on a small river that flows into the Black Sea. It has about 13,000 people and it's a very prosperous village in my opinion there it's surrounded by wine fields and grain fields so it looks like it's doing pretty well the other two villages i've visited were kassel and hofnostal which are northeast of odessa uh, hofnostal is about 140 kilometers north no, I should say northwest of right. Odessa, not northeast. Northwest of Odessa, and Kassel is east. No, Kassel is west of Hofnmustal, and we visited those two villages on the same day. Um, Kassel is only got about thirteen hundred people, and it's also uh, emphasizes grain grain growing around the village. We were visiting on a uh, on a school day, so while we were visiting the old church, um, the school next to the old church had recess, and all of the children were flooding out of the school, and they were very interested in what we were doing, and they were much like children in uh, Canada, actually. Uh, the teacher was a young woman, and she was able to speak. She spoke. Ukrainian and, and German and we talked a bit with her uh, in uh, Hofnostal uh, we visited the church 
which now has been made into a community center and they were doing renovations in the church so they were removing the curtains and uh, putting in new curtains uh, there's a theater in the church now and uh, a disco actually and they have found in Hofnumsel a number of gravestones of Germans from Russia and they've taken the, they've removed the gravestones from the original location and put them in a small fenced area by the um, village graveyard and they've set up a stone um, which indicates that these gravestones are from the original settlers that were in this village. And that was one of the things I was going to ask you if there were any remaining uh, German buildings, artifacts, or anything like So you've mentioned the, the uh, headstones. Uh, yes. Are there any other things that are a reminder of the original settlements? In Gross Lebenthal, the original church has been turned into an, a Russian Orthodox church, so it has the, the dome at the top. And while we were there, there was a service going on, uh, an Orthodox service, where the members were receiving blessings from the uh, priest in charge. Next to the church, there are a couple of old German buildings that were used as schools. And, we, and one of them has been turned into a kind of uh, sports building which has a gymnasium where athletes are training for the Olympic Games and so on. The building beside it is also a school and a couple have tried to turn it into a private residence. So they've added on to the back of the building, they've added on, onto it a, a hall, a small room where they have been holding um, banquets and wedding celebrations and so on. And they've also built onto it an outdoor disco. So they. So they have a stage set up and uh, a space for the disco dancers. Although the couple were saying now that times have been tough and they haven't gotten as many uh, clients to use their hall and their disco uh, disco space. So did you did you run into uh, German people, uh, German-speaking people in that area, other than the ones that were sort of designated in advance by the tour guides? I mean, are there, is there any sign of the German culture, language remaining? Not at all. I know that when we talked to the head woman in, in Kassel, she was indicating that the last German family had left, I think, I believe, 16 years ago, she had said the last German family, the husband and wife had passed away, so... Um, there, other than that, there were no German people speaking mm -hmm. in the, these three villages that I visited. Did you have any uh, way of reviewing the agricultural method uh, and comparing it, let's say, to the old Dorf and uh, the land away from the, the village of our uh, forefathers' time? Uh, is that still the way agriculture is practiced, or are they individual homes, uh, farm sites, or just how do they operate? Still the old village style, or? I can't say for sure, but I know we were talking to this head woman in Kassel, and she was saying that her village belonged to a, a Voloska district, and she, her village, Kassel, was one of the eight villages in this district, and these eight villages were governed by the eight people in charge, so they were in charge of what went on in the villages. So I'm not sure if they just shared equipment and they worked as a communal society. I don't believe they had individual properties, that's for sure. So they're still going back to the uh, Russian structure? Yes, I believe so. You had a similar tour a few years before. Yes. Uh, when was that? That was in 2008, and I, I visited the 
same three villages plus two other villages that I was interested in because they were daughter villages. They were the villages of Freidorf and Voynich, which my, my two of my grandparents lived in and were born in. And uh, they were much smaller villages and uh, were certainly in decline when I visited them compared to these three villages that I visited this time. Times, although there are difficulties in uh, fighting in the eastern part of the Ukraine, I, I mean, you really don't notice that when you're in Odessa and in the countryside around Odessa because, uh, for example, the there's a pedestrian street in downtown Odessa which is very lively, very crowded, um, restaurants and shops on both sides of the streets and uh, um, you have no feeling that there is any trouble in the country. Um, there were, uh, I know on Sunday I visited a, a, gar a city garden next to this uh, pedestrian shop and they had a bandstand and um, they had groups of Ukrainian dressed people in Ukrainian people dressed in their traditional costumes performing singing and dancing and it was a joyful time and uh, on the street there were a couple of women who were offering rides to the children they had a, a dr horse dressed painted dressed up and a small Shetland pony dressed up and they were offering rides to children on these on the Shetland pony and this large horse the only question I would say about their situation is um, with the floating currency, I'm sure they are suffering because when I went there in 2008, the exchange rate was about one Canadian dollar to five Ukrainian, Ukrainian uh, Krivnia. And this time it, it is one Canadian dollar to about 20 Krevnia, so obviously anything that they are buying, anything that the Canadian, Ukrainian government is buying from other countries is much more expensive to them. Uh, therefore, I mean, the people must be paying more for um, anything that certainly is supplied by other countries, is imported in, in from other countries. Did you, uh, was there a noticeable difference in how people seem to be living in the street when, you know, between the two times you were there? Not really. Um, I, th I think the three villages I visited and the, and Odessa seemed to be uh, basically the same, actually. Uh, the villages that I visited are are surrounded by um, wine, uh, grape, grape fields and uh, grain fields that look really um, great uh, harvests that they're going to have and uh, Odessa certainly seemed like a very crowded busy place with uh, traffic jams like any other city that I've seen. So when you, when you think of the land itself uh, from the area that, from Odessa yes. to Hofnungstall, uh, is it pretty well all steppe land or are there hills or any kind of uh, topography that uh, we're not familiar with in our readings of, of that area because everybody talks about the beautiful steppe land. It's very similar to some of the areas around Medicine I mean there are rolling hills, there are flat areas, um, so it very it varies from place to place, but um, it's very beautiful country actually. Like uh, I know, Hofnumstal. Um, we stopped prior to going into Hofnumstal, and we uh, walked up to this lookout place, and uh, Hofnumstal is is in a beautiful valley actually, and uh, well. Um, Kassel is more in a, a flat area, but uh, I mean to get to get from 
Kassel to Hofnussau was a challenge in itself because we were going on winding muddy roads while some of the main roads are really uh, paved and um, modern roads. Some of the side roads are very uh, very hazardous to vehicles because they've got a lot of potholes in them and a lot of uh, you have to be careful where you're driving because especially on the on the roads that aren't graded. So now we have a general idea where your people were were from. Uh, let's go back to where your uh, paternal side came from, specifically, and when they when they left uh, Russia to come to Canada, or indeed it may have been to U.S. I, I'm not sure of that, but maybe you could describe uh, when did they leave for. North America. My grandfather, Jacob Bender, came, he was 20 years old and he came with his brother's family in 1913. Um, they landed at Ellis Island and um, traveled to Forbes, North Dakota to meet up with some relatives that had previously come to that area and then they left for that area and homesteaded uh, near Hilda, Alberta. My grandfather bought a land land that was previously owned by another settler who gave up his land while his brother homesteaded a new section, new quarter section of land. My grandmother um, was an Esslinger, Magdalena Esslinger. Her family came much earlier in 1902 to the Ashley, North Dakota area. And they lived in that area for about 10 years before they immigrated up to Burstall, Saskatchewan. Through a matchmaker, my grandfather and grandmother were became married, although stories seem to indicate that they may have been not the greatest match, but they made a living but in, on a farm in the Hilda area. So why did they leave uh, that you're aware of? Uh, and, you know, both families, of course, yes. probably had a different reason because it was about a 10 year spread between the times they left. So did they say anything about why they left? Not really. I'm assuming that um, my grandfather, being 20 years old, I'm sure he was not. He was concerned about being conscripted into the army, um, and they had relatives over here who had come before, so they knew about the United States, and they knew about land that was available, and they knew about land that was available in Canada. So probably they were inspired to come by stories they had heard from uh, relatives that were already living here. I know for my mother's family it's about the same situation. Her mother's brother was came much earlier to the United States. I'm sure he left uh, Russia because he wanted to avoid the draft and wanted to avoid being conscripted into the Russian army. So uh, when they got to Canada uh, and settled here, uh, it was in the Hilda area for your pater uh, paternal side? Yes. Um, my grandfather settled in the Hilda area and my grandmother on my father's mother uh, the family was in Burstall, Saskatchewan uh, from, they came up here in 1913 and uh, my great-grandfather then lived in the Burstall area for about seven, eight years and then they decided to move down to uh, Lodi, California where a lot of Germans from Russia seemed to have gone actually and uh, although my grandmother and her brother 
of the family stayed up here, were married and stayed up here, the rest of the family moved down to Lodi, California. So whenever they settled, they were really looking for uh, compatriots, I imagine. Yes, it seems that way. Um, I know the main reason why the Esslinger family came from North Dakota up to uh, Bristol, I'm sure they were looking for better land because the land they settled in North Dakota was certainly by the time they came in 1902, most of the good land had already been gone and they certainly wanted better land. They tell you any other stories that are part of the family lore about the conditions when they got here or some of the circumstances they faced? Not really. Uh, I can't think of any no, story. <laughs> stories. No, <of laughs> they didn't have. No. So they didn't. In other words, it, it was pretty routine for them after they spent some time in the States. I think that's yes. sort of the case with many, many of the people that came here. When you were, uh, I take it you were born in the Hilda area. Yes, I was. Were, were you born in a, to a farm or a village or? I was born on a uh, farm northwest of Hilda, about eight miles northwest of Hilda. It was previously uh, the Dan Miller farm. They had come in 1910 and built, uh, built a house. Uh, it's been called a catalog house and it's still standing. It's an impressive building out there and my my parents were living on a rented farm and they were asked to leave. The farm was being sold so they decided to try and purchase the uh, Dan Miller farm which they did and um, they ended up pur purchasing uh, four quarters of land. Uh, no, two sections that would make eight quarters of land I guess about two sections of land they had out there. So you were in uh, connected then to the Burstall Hilda orbit, if, if you yes. could. And so that was predominantly German, I would take it. There were probably... Yes, definitely it was German and... Uh, Pretty well, most, same religion. Yes. Uh, the, I mean, we are village Hilda had two churches, a Baptist church and a and an evangelical church, oh, three churches I guess, a Baptist church, an evangelical church and a Lutheran church actually. So we had three churches and uh, and I think Burstall only had an evangelical church, might have had a Lutheran church too. So as a child or youth uh, you, in that area, did you notice any feelings that you had as a result of your Germanness? Was that a part of your life at all as you were growing up? For some areas and some people it was, but I'm not so sure uh, for you in a predominantly German area. I, I don't know. I mean, this is part of... I don't... I don't remember any feeling that we were any different from anyone else actually. Uh, everyone around us was either um, spoke, used the same slang German or used the same German words in speaking and, and played similar games than we did actually, so we weren't any different from anyone else actually. Uh, Never got the feeling from official them no. in the area. Same thing as an adult? Was it the same for you as an adult? It was the same for me as an adult. I don't remember ever being um, treated as being different than anyone else or uh, thinking that what I was out of place anywhere, that's for sure. So you're a, you were a baby at the end of the war. Yes. Yeah. So the the reaction might have been different by then. Uh, That's true. Than, than some of the experiences some people had. Uh, other than your comprehensive knowledge of the history of your uh, forebears, uh, are there any uh, 
cultural connections that remain with you or with parts of your family? For example, the language, do you still speak the dialect? I speak very little German and I know when I was in, uh, at the end of this tour, I was, I visited a, a relative of mine in Germany and the relative could not speak very good English and I couldn't speak very good German, but we got along and I understand quite a bit, I could understand most of what he said, but I, I cannot speak very much German, which is a regret of mine that I don't, I am not able to speak more German. But the, did he speak a dialect? Did he still have the dialect? Or do you know, was it high, uh, high modern high German or dialect? I'm not sure if, what it was. Do you have any customs, remaining customs in, in your family that, let's say, came from the old country that you're aware of? I don't really know if I have customs. I know that there were certain things that um, we were brought up, we were uh, expected to work hard and expected to do a job well, which has remained with me throughout life. And, and we also had customs when it came to um, just eating meals, I would say. I mean, we did, we, being on the farm, we recognized the value of food because we, we uh, raised the food. So in the German colonies in the Ukraine, it was, you know, it was almost considered a sin to waste food. And I think that has remained with me throughout all, all of my life that, I mean, there's not such a thing as taking food on your plate and not eating it or, or leftover food is never wasted. Um, you always saved leftover food. And, you know, it, I mean, ha church habits, like going to church on Sunday, has always been a habit that has in been ingrained in me. Uh, Sunday was always considered a day of rest, and usually you did not work on Sunday. And uh, going to church was always something you did on Sunday morning. Festivals or Christmas or anything wasn't extraordinary or different from the common practices. Not really. We we were our Christmases were nothing special. Uh, I don't think we were a rich f farming family that we could afford Christmas presents. I know going the things I remember of Christmas is going to church and receiving our little brown bag with the orange and a few sweets inside, but, and of course the Christmas concert, but other than that, uh, Christmas was not really special. We did have a Christmas concert in school, of course, and our little, I went to a little one-room school for eight years, for three years, and, and it had eight grades, and of course we had uh, a, a had to have a Christmas concert every year. Were there any, uh, is there any literature or uh, w were German books part of your uh, household or poetry or songs or whatever? Were there any, any of those that were in German or? The only books that I know, I still have some of those books. I mean, we did, did of course have German Bibles and uh, German song books and I mean in the early years of course the the church services were held in German and the singing was in German and um, that was the way it was until uh, quite late in my life actually. Mm -hmm. You've already said you were uh, born in the Hilda area so uh where were you educated beyond that area? I went, well, I went to the One Room Country School, which was about a mile away from our house for three years, and then um, all these small country schools were consolidated so that we all attended school in Hilda. So I went to Hilda's school for eight years, 
and then um, I went to a high school in Medicine Hat for my grade 12. And once I completed grade 12, I went to um, the University of Calgary and got training to be a teacher. And I, no, I shouldn't say that. I should say that I went to Medicine Hat Junior College the first year to be trained to be a teacher. And the second year I went to the University of Calgary. So at that time we only had to have two years training before we uh, started teaching. So I, after that I taught at a little school out by south of Elkwater called Lebanon School. I taught there for three years and then I taught many years at a Hunterite school out by Hilda again. Could you tell us some experiences you had at the Hutterite school because certainly uh, you would have had different from the standard school. Uh, the standard public school would have been different demands and so on. Could you describe some of it? Because they're also part of our yes. heritage. Yes, they are. Um, I have. It's surprising that their dialect is, was so different for me that I hardly could understand what they were saying. Uh, although some of their slang words were, of course, understandable, but uh, I mean, we, our school was a one-room school, eight grades. They started school when they were seven years old. They couldn't speak in any English, so I was teaching them how to speak English while I was dealing with seven other grades and uh, when they became 15 they were considered adults and their education continued outside of the public school. So it was a good experience because um, I mean if you wanted to uh, gain weight, it's a good place to gain weight because they certainly fed you, fed, fed you enough and uh, um, and uh, every every morning the children had uh, Germans, what they term German school, so um, they had a German teacher who taught them how to uh, write in the old German script in, in books and after my English, what they termed English school, they had also had German school. Uh, the children had German schools. So, so it was a different experience. Uh, we certainly played games that uh, are played in other schools. Uh, we played softball and games like that and dodgeball and tried to uh, play indoor games too. Did you have quite a bit of freedom as far as, other than the curriculum, which I understand is set by the department, mm -hmm. did you have quite a bit of freedom from, let's say, the authorities in the colony? Well, this this was a Lair-like colony and it is certainly more conservative than the Darius Light or the Schmidl Light villages because the Lairites did not allow me to use any audiovisual aids at all, so I was not permitted to use um, an overhead projector, not permitted to use computers, um, not uh, sh shouldn't couldn't show any films of any kind, couldn't use a television or any any of that. So this was just book learning and. Uh, and they were very strict about that. And the uh, the students uh, were they were they able to meet the uh, curriculum? Because obviously they would have had some advantage because they were taking German at the same time, mm -hmm. which gives them something uh, base. Were they uh, able to keep up with the curriculum despite their language limitations? You know, they started with yes. They come in with no English, right? I, I think these the children were very similar to other children in other schools. I mean, there were some students who were very, very skilled in in doing their work, and there were some children yeah. who were average, and some children who had difficulties. So it depended very much on 
on some of the families and their attitudes towards education. Well, some of the families didn't uh, help their children to succeed in school. Other families uh, helped their children a great deal. So they weren't really any different as a group? From Not really. Uh, I mean, they. I would say they treat education as a little as as a little bit different than we do because they think of education not just as school education but education they receive in the colony. So we think usually of education as something that occurs in school, while they think of education as something that not only occurs in school but outside the colony when they're trained to to in certain occupations like as in a a pig boss or a chicken boss or a gardener or some other skill. So was, it, was there some advantage for you uh, in teaching there because of your background, do you think? Did they recognize that or were they indifferent to that, the fact that you had some German? I think there was some advantage to it because I could, um, it was helpful in in teaching the children um, English vocabulary because I was able, if they couldn't understand what something was, I could try and say it in German and and help them in that respect. And also, uh, I guess it's always helpful to understand what children are saying in German when they're not when they don't want you to hear. Actually, <laughs> so that was your your occupation. Your occupation was. Uh very specific at that time. Yes. You, you were a teacher of all things. Yes, I was. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else we've missed with regard to your, uh, particularly your knowledge and your, your background? Because as I said at the beginning, when I talked to you about this interview, is that I wanted to emphasize you, the, the breadth of your knowledge of the Germans from Russia. And the requirements that are there for someone to get to the level that you're at. Mm -hmm. So is there anything I've missed that uh, we might have talked about? I think you've covered everything. I mean, if people want to learn about their background, their Germans from Russia background, I would strongly recommend that they belong to a society such as the Germans from Russia Society because I have certainly learned a great deal about resources. I've learned a great deal about uh, the history of the Germans from Russia. I've learned about relatives that I never knew about. So just by belonging to a Germans from Russia society, you learn a great deal. And since I've become a member, these Germans from Russia societies have done a great deal in developing resources, translating resources, so they've made more resources available to people who no longer can read the German language. So I would definitely say that um, these German from Russia societies should be highly regarded as um, keepers of our history, actually. Well, Mel, I thank you very much for uh, sharing your knowledge with us, and I know that you've made a considerable contribution to the to the area, and that you will continue to help all the people who are involved in the genealogy society and any who have heard about your knowledge and will be consulting with you. Uh, thank you very much for t today and for all the work that you've done. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you.